everyone and welcome to my session. I'm Monica Beckwith, a Java champion, and I work at optimizing the JVM at Microsoft. Today I'm going to talk about our journey with enabling Java on Windows and ARM64 systems. Here's a brief agenda. I'm going to start with introduction to OpenJDK and ARM64. I will then talk about our port and by providing background a few nuances that we gathered on the way and then the timeline. I will then jump to testing and benchmarking and then talk about next steps. If we still have time, then I'm going to provide a quick demo. So let's get started. Let's first talk about the OpenJDK project itself. The JDK in OpenJDK stands for Java Development Kit. So OpenJDK is a free and open source reference implementation of the Java SE. And it's licensed under the GNU GPL version 2 uh, with class path exception. Let me provide a quick timeline with respect to OpenJDK becoming open source. Many of you may know that OpenJDK used to be SunJDK. And back in 2006, Sun open sourced the Java virtual machine, which is called Hotspot. And then in 2007, Sun open sourced almost all of the uh, JDK itself. In 2010, 100% of the JDK was open sourced. And 2010 was also the time where Oracle acquired Sun. Let's look at uh, the same timeline, but with respect to the community involvement. So by 2007, we saw Red Hat signing the uh, what is no, now known as the OCA, the Oracle Contributors Agreement. Back then, it was called Sun Contributors Agreement. And then there's also something called the TCK. So Red Hat also became a part, uh, signed the TCK. Next came the Porters Group, and this is very important because Porters Group helps with bringing the OpenJDK to newer architectures and operating systems. So that, was, that group was formed in 2007. And by 2010, uh, we had IBM, SAP, Apple, everybody being involved from the OpenJDK community. In 2013, uh, a star was born and that star is Microsoft. So Microsoft collaborated with Azul Systems uh, to provide the best experience for users on uh, Azure. Now with that, let's move on and talk about ARM a bit. ARM is what we know as RISC architecture, which is the short form for Reduced Instruction Set Computer. So basically, RISC provides highly optimized instruction set, and it also has a large number of registers. Okay? The one thing that's important to know about uh, ARM uh, is the load store architecture. So for commodity hardware out there, uh, you may be familiar with x86-64. So when we're trying to access memory in an x86-64 architecture, we have the data processing instructions that can directly access the memory. Uh, but that's not the case with respect to load store architectures. So with load store architectures, actually you have to access memory via specific instructions. And these instructions are called memory access instructions. So usually you load your uh, data into processor registers and then you store it into memory. So it would look something like this. An example would be LDR, RT, and address. So here RT is an integer register. Now with that, let's move on to ARM64. Many of you may know ARM64 also as ART64. ARM64 is what in Windows world uh, In Windows world, uh, we call it ARM64 because it's a new 64-bit ISA defined by ARM. And what that means is that in your integer registers, your data, and your pointers are all 64-bit wide. Many of you may know ARM as a weaker memory model. 
With ARM64, multiple copy atomicity was introduced. ARM64 started with the ARM V8 ISA. Prior to ARM V8, uh, the atomicity was only single copy, which means that all threads are not guaranteed to see the write simultaneously. So, with respect to these weaker memory models, if you need to in enforce the order of operation, then you need barriers and fences. So basically, barriers and fences are needed for access ordering. Uh, an example uh, would be instruction synchronization barrier. An ISP instruction flushes the CPU pipeline as well as various buffers. The other thing that I wanted to highlight about ARM64 is the release consistency model. So which means that it provides one-way barriers such as load acquired and store release. So it's kind of an optimization. So here you see a code snippet from our code base. And here we're trying to provide order access. So you can see that load acquire right here, uh, store release right here, and then sequential consistency. Um, to read more about sequential consistency, please do uh, look up the ARM V8 ISA. Now let's move on to the systems, the test systems that we used uh, during our uh, development as well as for CI CD. So I'm going to provide a quick timeline with respect to the ARM ISA. As I mentioned, ARM64 started at ARM V8, and we have a system called the EMAG system. Now EMAG is an Ampere computing product. EMAG is also known as Applied Macros, Xgene 3, and Skylark. Next in the ISA timeline comes ARM V8.1. With respect to V8.1, we have the Thunder X2 systems. For those that do not know anything about Thunder X2 systems, let me assure you that it's quite a fascinating system. It has 256 hardware threads. Um, Thunder X2 is, um, is a Cavium Inks product, and now it's owned by Marvell Technologies. Next comes ARM V8.2. We have our very own Surface Pro X systems. Uh, as you, many of you may know, Microsoft and Qualcomm work together to bring us the SQ1 and SQ2 processors. So right now, many of the uh, systems that are based on V8.3 architectures are either in development or have been announced and will be available soon. Now let's jump into our port. I'll provide background, a few nuances, as well as timeline. So what is an OpenJDK port? Let's start there. So as I mentioned, uh, whenever you have a newer platform, uh, especially a newer architecture or a new OS offering, then we have to make sure that Java is available to this new platform. In order to be able to run Java applications on this new platform, we need to make sure that we have something called the Java runtime environment available. Similarly, in order to be able to develop on this new platform, we need to make sure that the JDK, the Java Development Kit, is available on this new platform. So let's look at a JRE first. A Java runtime environment consists of your virtual machine as well as your class libraries. So the virtual machine itself consists of runtime as well as uh, the execution engine and the class libraries is, consists of the UI toolkit as well as a new of your like, you know, base, uh, lang, utils, so on and so forth. A JDK is a superset of a JRE. A JDK provides tools and utilities for a Java developer to be able to debug as well. Now let's look at OpenJDK Hotspot, the virtual machine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to provide an overview from the point of view of the, the repo itself, so the source repo in OpenJDK. What is very interesting is the way these co the code is organized within the hotspot directory. So most of the code, as you may know, is not OS specific and neither is it architecture specific. For example, your code for memory management, your JIT compilers, your metadata, all that uh, resides in a share folder. 
And then the rest is organized uh, as follows. So you will have the CPU folder for anything that's architecture specific. For example, for us, we were looking at the AART64 directory. So one thing I wanted to uh, highlight here and also give a shout out is to the Red Hat OpenJDK community. So the Red Hat team was the first one to port OpenJDK to ARM64 and they did that for Linux. So we were lucky to be able to follow their footsteps and that's why it was easy for us because they had already paved the way for us. So big shout out to Red Hat for all the work. Similarly, there's the OS directory that has OS specific code and then you'll see Windows and Linux in there. So this time I want to provide a shout out to Oracle because of, of the amazing directory setup, the modular organization of the code base. Uh, finally comes the OS and architecture specific code and that resides in o OS underscore CPU directory. So most of the changes that we did was uh, of course in the Windows and AR64 directory. Let's quickly dive into runtime. So there's one goal for runtime, and that is turning bytecode into native code. Uh, so many of you may know runtime as interpreter, but the runtime also performs various other functions such as class loading, synchronization, thread management, yada, yada, yada. So our changes with respect to runtime were in the JVM construction and destruction, uh, and we wanted to make sure that it understands the structured exception handling uh, that is needed for Windows. Next, let's look at the execution engine. When we talk about the execution engine, we mean your JIT compilers, your memory management units, etc. So Hotspot has two JIT compilers, C1, also known as the client compiler, and C2, known as the server compiler. Hotspot provides tiered compilation, so you have various stages with respect to uh, the profile guided information, and then finally you reach uh, C2. Many of our changes were in the execution engine, uh, so and they were to be able to enable ARM64 specific changes, Windows specific changes, and Windows ARM specific changes. And we'll quickly give examples for each of them. So with that, let's move on to our learnings. The first and foremost thing that I wanted to highlight was is an OS specific nuance, and it's the uh, special the way register R18 is handled. So R18 is a platform register, and so that means that it's reserved, and it has special meaning in user internal mode. So we had to treat it as reserved. So if you remember when I talked about existing uh, Linux and ARM64 work that was done in the hotspot directory, so this particular nuance is specific to Windows, and we've also found out that it's applicable to Mac as well. So we could take this learning to into the Mac port as well, which I'll talk about shortly. The next thing is the ability to invalidate instruction cache. So we have, an, uh, we have a method uh, that we can use in Windows uh, by invoking the process thread API, and it's called the flush instruction cache method right here. Next, let's look at a few more things. So on the Windows and ARM64 platform, we could put in many optimizations for copy and, and byte swaps. The other thing we could do was to identify features that are very CPU specific. Uh, and those are like the, your AES instructions, the CRC32. And this is a snippet of how we did that in the code base right here. Moving on to Windows and MSVC, there are a lot of intrinsics that your static compiler will offer. And so we worked with the MSVC team to learn more about those intrinsics. I already talked about the read-write barriers. We also incorporated a few built-ins, like for example here underscore no op. And here as you can see, we checked for the compiler and then you asked to use the MSVC intrinsic for no op. Finally, uh, and the most intriguing of all the changes was the LP64 versus the LLP64 change. So let me take some time to explain what that means. Basically, we had to extend 64-bit long ints and pointers to 64-bit long, long ints and pointers because that's what the Windows platform needs. 
So basically within the LP64 and LLP64 model, if I had to do a table, it would look something like that. And as you can see, long on an LP64 is 64 bit, whereas long on an LLP64 is 32 bits only. Long long on both LP64 as well as LLP64 are 64 bits. So why does it matter to us? Because again, if you remember that uh, Red Hat already had um, a Linux port for ARM64 uh, that was, of course, following the LP64 model. But because we introduced Windows to ARM64 uh, and Windows follows the LLP64 model, so we encountered a lot of issues at the very beginning and we had to make sure that we are updating all the pointers and uh, ints accordingly. So now let's jump on to the timeline. So here is where you get to meet the team. So first comes me uh, back in February. I started working on this part-time, just trying to investigate the amount of work that may be needed. I started fiddling on an Emacs system that had Windows on it. I was able to get the Java version string printed and right after that, there was a core dump. After that, um, uh, Ludovic uh, joined the team and at the same time, we started interacting with the MSVC team and trying to learn about the intrinsics, etc. that I was talking about earlier. Uh, Ludovic also helped uh, with uh, bringing uh, JDREC testing. And while I was trying to get uh, bits and pieces out of the benchmarks and especially get JMH, which is the Java Micro Benchmark Harness, which I'll talk about quickly as I talk about testing and benchmarking. Right around the mid to end of April, we got our Thunder X2 and Surface Pro X systems. And uh, that helped us a lot with doing some scaling tests because I remember I mentioned Thunder X2 systems being uh, 256 hardware threads. So there were some problems that the this kind of concurrency uh, beast would be able to highlight that Emacs did not were not able to highlight. And Surface Pro X's could also highlight some other issues, which I'll talk about shortly. Beginning of May, we were able to get some of the SpecCert benchmarks working. So SpecCert is a suite of benchmarks, and the suite not only provides scores with respect to operations per second, it also provides you the power consumption for that server class system. So it's very helpful, especially that given that we are on an ARM64 system, to be able to measure the power gains, etc. So uh, this was one of the benchmarks that we were targeting for our port. So by May, we had C C1 and Parallel GC enabled. We went with Parallel GC because we encountered a bug in G1. Around the same time, we realized that we needed to do some benchmark mo modifications as well as enable more than 64 cores. So when we tried this benchmark on the Thunder X2 system, this is how the CPU utilization looked. So we, like I said, we have 256 hardware threads, but we can only fire up uh, 64 cores. And to, by mid-May, um, thanks to Ludovic, we had C2 fully functional, as well as I made some changes to spec search to make sure that all the, the JNI code, as well as the 64, more than 64 core identification uh, was complete. And we started uh, full-scale testing. So by the end of all the changes, this is how the CPU utilization looked while running the spec cert benchmark right here. By June, uh, Bernhard joined our team and we started a dialogue with the Red Hat team. Uh, at that point, we wanted to not only socialize our patches, we also wanted to understand how what they thought about our patches and, and what would be a complete set of uh, test systems and uh, combinations. If you remember the G1GC bug that I mentioned, Bernhard actually helped fix that. I, the bug itself was not in G1GC, but in MSVC. And so we introduced a workaround uh, in our port. By end of June, under the guidance of Red Hat, we surfaced our patches. And by now we had divided our port into patches and in incremental patches that could be applied on tip. So when we started the port, we were at GDK 15, and now uh, we were at GDK 16. So this, this way, we could easily rebase them. We also released our early access binaries on our GitHub repo, and uh, we started testing 
uh, for Swing and Java 2D, and that's when we found the bug with respect to Surface Pro X. And the bug was very simple, and uh, and thanks to the good relationship that we had with MSVC team, we had a quick fix to the bug. Now let's look at the JEP process. So JEP is the Java Enhancement Proposal, and it's a very important step with respect to contributions of this magnitude. So we started our JEP process by drafting the JEP in July. Uh, the JEP quickly became a candidate thanks to the great collaboration offered to us by Oracle uh, and also the reviews and everything were done very quickly for the JEP. At the same time, spec search changes were also approved by the spec committee. By August, all three of us were already committers in the OpenJDK ARM64 project. And um, by the end of August, we enabled all the garbage collectors and we did scaling tests on, uh, on Thunder X2 with respect to all three. So G1GC, ZGC, and Shenandoah, well, we enabled all of them and did scaling tests on them. Uh, and by end of September, our port was targeted for JDK 16. And now we are already integrated and we are open JDK. Let's jump to testing and benchmarking. As I had mentioned, we divided our changes into incremental patches. So we wanted to make sure that those patches cleanly applied to TIP. In order to be able to provide a complete set of test results, we wanted to make sure that other platforms did not see any regression. So we tested on the Linux ARM64, of course the Windows ARM64 platform, and uh, Windows and Linux x86-64 as well. Uh, we enabled CI for JDREG tests, which is the regression test harness. And these, this is a look into how we enabled each phase of it, which we're at the last phase right now, and that's the adopt QA test that we still have to enable. Here is a quick matrix of SpecJBB 2015 benchmark and how we tested on different systems right here. Here's a quick overview of our workload status and the benchmarking ma matrix. This is only a subset. To find the entire set, please check out our GitHub page. So you can see we have enabled a uh, few of those. Some of them had problems with respect to some very uh, architecture specific code. Um, so, so let's move on to next steps. Our journey has just begun. We uh, not only want to be keeping our port up to date, we also want to work very closely with the Win Windows and memory management team at Microsoft. We already see certain API level changes that we can bring to certain garbage collectors that can benefit from them. Uh, we will continue working with MSBC team and make sure that OpenJDK benefits from any of the optimizations there. I mentioned briefly about the macOS port, so that's something else that we are contributing to, and you can find uh, the, the RFE right here. Uh, we brought our learnings not only with respect to the register R18 that I mentioned, but also to the CPU de feature detection, etc. We also recently added JVMC and AOT support to our code, uh, and we are going in the process of backporting to J JDK 11 update and we'll provide this backboard for both Windows and Mac OS. And with that, let's check out the demo. I have a demo right here. Uh, it's a recording and I'm gonna play it at a higher speed, but I'm gonna talk through it as it keeps on working. So this is a Surface Pro X. And you can see the processors there. I'm now gonna go modify the code, which says howdy from Spring Boot using Java running on Windows and ARM64. I close that. Now I'll go look at the Java version. And yes, it's showing Windows and ARM64. That's great, awesome. I now go build and run uh, the package. And that looks like a good start. I open a browser, look at the localhost 8080 port, and there you see Howdy from Spring Boot using Java running on Windows and ARM64. And that's it um, for the demo. I want to thank you all for being here with me today. Uh, I have provided some links here. Please go ahead and check this out. Our PR that got merged is right here. A few announcements with respect to Windows and Mac OS ports that we have helped with. 
and um, go ahead uh, download the binaries and take it for a spin on your Surface Pro X's. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it.